Excellent. Thank you all very much for, for being here. And uh, we've got a great panel coming up next. Our panel is talking about the cities of the global south. Uh, how will cities of the global south overcome their complex challenges and their massive transformations? So uh, I'm going to go through and very briefly introduce the panel. First of all, on my left is uh, Fumi Olapade, who is the Associate Dean of Global Health at the University of Chicago Medicine. Uh, next to her is Gary White, who's the CEO and co-founder of Water.org and Water Equity. Next is Leslie Loco, who's the Professor of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg, and she's also uh, a novelist. Uh, Next is Edward Glaser, who is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University. And last but not least is Abba Joshi Ghani, who is the Senior Advisor for Public-Private Partnerships at the World Bank in, uh, in Washington, DC. So I'm going to start off just give you uh, a few uh, interesting data points. So 24 of the 31 cities with populations over 10 million are in the Global South. Uh, 1.5 million people are added to the global urban population every week, and of that, 90% of those people live in Africa and Asia. And a final statistic is that 881 million people live in urban slums in developing countries, and this number is uh, constantly growing. Now, uh, we've been chatting backstage and, uh, and before this panel, and I guess somewhat predictably, we've come up uh, with a challenge to the title of our, uh, mm -hmm. of our panel. Um, and I'm just going to summarize that, that challenge a little bit. Uh, when we talk about the global south, um, it's a bit of a weird construct. And uh, we understand sort of why it's been put together, but it is a bit weird uh, for several reasons. It includes cities as diverse as Shanghai and Kinshasa. Uh, it's also... Um, if you think about it, I grew up in a place called New Zealand. Some of you may have been there, and uh, you hopefully all know about it. Uh, it's pretty far south, but it would be categorized as the global north, actually. Mm -hmm. even, within, uh, even within countries uh, such as India, you know, if we, if we think about the sort of classic definition of global south, it it's also includes regions within countries. Um, but a country like India, actually, the... the part that would be considered more the south in, in this uh, terminology is in the north. So uh, as a journalist, I like clarity of ideas and clarity of, uh, of language. Um, and really, global south is quite a euphemistic term, really, when you think about it. What we mean, probably, is poor places. So we talk about the global south, we're talking about poorer places, uh, what we call developing, emerging, but effectively, it's places that are behind uh, economically and, and in some other ways, some important other ways. Um, but we're going to use it as a sort of catch-all term, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to go through the panelists to start with and ask them uh, how they frame it and what they see as the key uh, challenges and, and potentially opportunities uh, in these cities that we, we des describe as the Global South. So I'm going to start with uh, Professor Glazer. Uh, he's going to give us his, his definition. Great, thank you, Julian. It's, it's uh, wonderful to be back here at the Chicago, uh, the Chicago Forum. Um, I, I think perhaps the most amazing phenomenon that has happened across this world over the last 60 years is the urbanization of the poor world. In 1960, not a single one of the world's poorest countries, those countries with per capita incomes below $1,000 in modern dollars, not a single one of them was more than one-third urban. Today, more than 40% of the world's poorest countries are more than one-third urban. And we see the rise of megacities like Kinshasa or Karachi in places that are both poor and often poorly governed. Now, make no mistake, I think there's enormous promise in urbanization. I know of no pathway out of poverty into prosperity that does not run through city streets. Right? When you compare those countries that are more than 50% urban to those countries that are less than 50% urban, the more urbanized countries have incomes that are five times higher. And perhaps even more importantly, they have infant mortality levels that are less than one-third. Cities are also about quality of life, right? In wealthier countries, typically people who live in cities are no happier than people who live in rural areas. In New Zealand, actually, the rural dwellers are happier, I hate to tell you, uh, which may tell you something about South Island. But in the poorest parts of this world, above all in India, the happiness gap exists and it strongly favors 
the urbanites, that in fact, it's not that living in a Mumbai slum is such a great thing, but it beats living in the poverty of rural India, just as living in a favela outside of Rio beats the rural northeast of Brazil. These are places of hope and possibility, but there are also places of great challenge. There are demons that come with density. If two people are close enough to exchange an idea face to face, they're also close enough to exchange a pathogen, to exchange a disease. And if someone is close enough to sell you a newspaper, they're close enough to rob you, to mug you, right? And the great job, the great vocation of the 21st century is fighting to tame those demons of density fighting to make sure that these cities can be places of hope and opportunity, just as Chicago was in the late 19th century. And that means dealing with contagious disease, clean water, crime, traffic congestion, high housing costs, right? education, making sure that government does what it should and not what it shouldn't. Because in fact, there is no way to handle these problems just with laissez-faire. We need effective governments, and so often we are looking at governments that are not effective. So I, I think the problems are enormous, but the opportunities are also great. And if I were 22 years old, I can think of nothing that would be a more exciting way for me to give my life than to engage with the cities of the developing world and try to make sure that they can be as amazing as we know that they can be. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Abba, why don't you uh, tell us, your, how, how do you frame this and how are you, wh where are you focused when you're talking about the, the cities of the global south? Um, thank you, Jamil. And I think Ed framed it so well in terms of opportunities, challenges, and how urbanization is the phenomena of this century and is also the, one of the most transforming things happening in the developing world. Um, but I think the challenges are huge, and um, I would just name a few because there are many. And one of them is, you know, um, city-based uh, revenues. How are cities uh, financing the infrastructure needs that the growing population requires? So that's in terms of affordable housing, it's in terms of water, sanitation, good roads, um, electricity, and all of that. But what happens is that all of this infrastructure finance actually requires very stable stream of revenues and leveraging of public resources. But when you look at cities or municipalities, and I may add here that most of the urbanization now is not happening in mega cities, but is happening in secondary cities, which don't have enough revenues, don't have enough capacity, and yet they're burgeoning population. Um, and the key thing then is, you know, the fiscal system of cities. And we find that in most developing countries, cities have very little authority over the revenues that they raise, the assets that they own. Um, so own source revenues are basically property taxes, which are not revised for generations. So you could live in a beautiful house in the center of Mumbai and not be paying even 1% in terms of property taxes and um, own source revenues or user fees. Water is not charged correctly. Um, electricity is not charged correctly. And then sometimes the public land in cities also does not belong to cities. So how you, do you leverage such an important, uh, uh, such an important asset? Um, and in fact, uh, even large cities in India are still struggling with double entry accounting. So they are still in old systems. They have no sense of what assets they own, what their income is. So when you have this kind of uh, lack of capacity and lack of information and, uh, and a lack of a, a power in terms of devolution of power from the center, then I think for me, the key question is how do these cities then move forward to meet the um, sustainable development goals, which are not that far away, and how do they make their cities livable and provide a quality of life to citizens who have come there, as Ed mentioned, uh, looking for opportunities, um, looking to create um, wealth to do better than what they were doing in rural areas. Great. Uh, Leslie, why don't we Great. move to you? Great, thank you. I mean, I should say it's wonderful to be back in Chicago, which as an architect, I, I really think of as the home of architecture. And I live in Johannesburg, which is probably one of the largest cities in the youngest continent in the world. The average age of Africa is around 19 years old. So it's an enormous um, privilege, actually, to be living, working, thinking, making in, in a context that's so young. 
I think um, Richard Sennett puts it, who's another Chicagoan, puts it very beautifully that you know, one of the main challenges we face today as city dwellers is how to live with people who are not like yourself. Um, and I think this is true of, of cities in the global south equally as it is in, in the global north. And for me, the term is a slightly misleading one. It's about being defined in relation to what you are not, which is a very long tradition of, you know, we talk about the third world in relation to the first world, the developing world in relation to the developed and so on. I would say one of the key challenges is for us to take hold of the terms that define us. Um, I, I can think of no better and more op optimistic place to be than, than in the city of the global south. Thank you. Gary, do you want to tell us about what you're focused on in particular when you're looking at cities of the For Sure, of the so it's, it's water and sanitation. Uh, so imagine this morning, instead of turning on your faucet, you had to walk six hours to get your water. Or instead of walking down the hall to use the toilet, you had to search for a place to go to the bathroom several hours that day. Or what if you were spending 25% of your income to pay for your water bill? So this is, this is the reality of people living in cities around the world. This is the reality for about 844 million people who lack access to water, and about 2.3 billion who lack access to sanitation. No city has ever achieved sustainability, yet alone thrive, without first solving water and sanitation. And right now we have a two-tier system in many of the big cities where the affluent can get connected, but the poor can't. And so what we see is huge amounts of coping cost. So the people walking to collect water, the value of that lost time, the poor health of drinking poor quality water, uh, all of these payments to water vendors because people don't have a connection at their home, these add up to about $300 billion a year. So that's all the bad news, right? The good news in this is that that $300 billion represents capital in the system largely being paid by the poor that can be redirected into more sustainable solutions. The challenge is that people in cities can't get connected to the utilities because they can't afford the $300 connection fee to pay to connect to the utility. They can afford to pay a buck a day to get water from a vendor, but they can't afford the $300 all at once. And so what we've done is reinterpret this problem. I think most people see this as a charity issue in terms of water in developing countries. So we don't see it as a crisis of charity, we see it as a crisis of capital. We don't see the poor as a problem to be solved, but as a market to be served. And so that's why we created Water Credit, which helps people get access to affordable loans so that they can pay those connection fees, so they don't have to go to a loan shark and pay 125% interest to build a toilet, so that they can get affordable capital that they can then improve this system for themselves. Their day-to-day -day costs for water and sanitation drop dramatically once they get access to these loans. We've now helped more than 12 million people in cities get access to these loans and leveraged about $800 million in capital from the private capital markets to fund these loans. So these solutions, the, the problems in this context contains its own solutions. That's why I'm hopeful that more people will climb out of poverty because they get access to water and sanitation and redirect those coping costs, and they can be part of cities that thrive. Great. Uh, Fumi, why don't you tell us what you're, what you're focused on? Yeah, so it's really great to be on this panel because I grew up in Lagos, one of those uh, global south cities, and I came to Chicago, and I live in Chicago, a wonderful city. And those are the two places I've lived in my life. And, uh, and they actually, um, there's a lot to learn about how you survive and you thrive in a city. Because I'm a city girl, and when I came to this country, everyone told me I had to go live in the suburbs. And I said, that's not possible, I'm from Lagos. And that's because, as you, as you said, there's a lot of activity in cities that give you capital to actually develop yourself and to become uh, globally aware. And so education and healthcare are key to getting people out of those slums into a sustainable economy. And the same obtains in Lagos as on the south side of Chicago. Uh, every city has to figure out a way to get citizens to be gainfully employed. That's why we talk about the fact that health is wealth. The question is, are people poor because they are unhealthy, or are they unhealthy because they are poor? 
So I'm a physician, and what I actually see about the opportunities to learn about how to run cities and get people to be upwardly mobile is, you know, it's a good example is Chicago. We talk about the physical uh, architecture of a city that actually gets people to be able to go on the lakefront and enjoy a city, whether they're rich and they're on the north shore of the city or they're poor on the south side of the city. So I think there's a lot really that we can learn from each other. So this idea about global south, to me, is, it doesn't really matter because there are examples of really thriving cities in the global south and there are places in the north that still need help because there are poor people everywhere, including in America, in my neighborhood in Chicago. I really like uh, the diversity of this panel in the sense that each person has their priority. And uh, I want to start a little bit of a conversation here um, because, Abba, you've, you've talked about finance in particular and, uh, and about how that's critical in getting that right. Uh, uh, you, we've heard about education and, uh, and also about health, and we've heard about water. So I'm wondering, maybe we'll start with Ed, what, uh, and we can get into a bit of a debate, uh, healthy and polite debate. Uh, more <laughs> CNN than Fox News, probably. Um, but if, uh, maybe Ed, why don't you tell us, which one of the, these priorities are you, do you think is the most important? I, I think it depends where you are. Uh, there, to me, at least, there's a hierarchy, and uh, I, I share the view that water comes first, because there is no crime wave that are, is as deadly as a cholera epidemic. And indeed, getting water, getting sanitation under control is the first order of business. And when I'm in sub-Saharan Africa, I am entirely focused on, on water. When I'm in Latin America, which are, you know, where, where cities have, have emerged 50 years ago in, uh, in large size, and water is still a problem, but it's a less severe problem, I worry more about crime. I worry about, more about personal safety. Um, I think everywhere we worry about traffic congestion. Right? But it's, it's, a less, it's less pressing in sub-Saharan Africa than, than water. It's less pressing than, uh, uh, and we worry about it here in Chicago. We worry about it uh, in, in Boston, in New York, and, and in London. Um, and in, uh, you know, high housing costs are the other side of, of, the, of the success of a city. When a city, you know, is in high demand and doesn't allow enough housing, it faces the challenge of, of high housing costs, unaffordable housing, to which there is no, no way out other than, other than supply. So I, I see this as being a hierarchy. Um, I do think there are similar things that run through all of them, and maybe we'll get back to that. But I mean, in terms of major themes that you want to think about, technology is never enough, right? It's always about some combination of incentives, institution, and engineering. Right? There's no way to build your way out of traffic congestion. The economist Gilles Darantin and Matthew Turner have identified the fundamental law of highway traffic, which is that vehicle miles traveled increase roughly one for one with highway miles built. If you build it, they will drive it. Okay? Which does not mean that we don't need more roads in Sub-Saharan Africa, but if we don't also think about what policies we have to constrain congestion, we also have a problem. And I'll, I'll avoid talking about the stories about the last mile problem, but it's a similar problem, that we build water mains and we don't worry about how we're going to have people connecting and it's a, it becomes a, a, a big issue. And similarly in the case of policing, it's about social policing as well as sort of actual prisons, right? Prisons are a tiny part of the answer. The right answer is to make sure that we have police who work effectively with the community and leverage the community to be a, a tool for its own safety. And ideally, we have communities like, you know, like Daravi, which was mentioned earlier, where you're perfectly safe in Daravi, not because of anything to do with the Mumbai constabulary. You're safe because, in fact, the city watches its own which, of course, is one of Jane Jacobs' greatest, greatest points. So I'll stop, I'll stop there, but, but I think the question is, what's more, most important depends on where you sit, not that there's one universal answer for that. Well, yeah. If, if yeah. I just pick up on the water piece, since you, you joined my camp, that's great. Welcome. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's not just what's the biggest problem. It's I, had a, I had a five great grandfather who died in the cholera epidemic of New York in 1849, so I, I have this issue in my birthright. The, uh... Yeah. Well, I think it's not just... Uh, is it what's the worst or what's the, the most pressing? I think it's an intersection of like, what's the severity of it? What's the intersection with equity with it? And what's the intersection of solvability? I think those are things that, that I look at and see those, those clearly being demonstrated in water. Of course, you know, my opening comments show the severity of this. It doesn't also, though, take into account the health costs, the, the fact that girls are spending uh, 266 million hours every day walking to collect water. So what happens? Well, they're not in school. They're not building a future. So the severity of it is there. 
I think the equity of it is, you know, most of us have probably traveled in some of the cities and the countries of the South, and you know when you go into a hotel and you turn on the water, the water comes out, right? So the five-star hotels, the businesses, the middle class, they do have access to, to water there, and they have toilets that flush. Uh, and so it's the poor who lack access. So it's a huge disparity uh, in inequity in this problem. And I think the final thing is the solvability. And if we have a system now that these, these coping costs of $300 billion are actually more than what it would cost to get everybody in the world access to water and sanitation, it really is more than the cost. If we can just redirect those things, it's solvable. I think that's what we've done. We've demonstrated that you don't need to give people uh, a handout, but you just need to give them a loan. And the fact is that poor people repay these loans at 99%. More than half of them live on less than $2 a day. This has become such a bankable approach. We now have created a whole separate entity, Water Equity, which raises social, in in social impact capital from investors in the US. Investors invest in the funds. We get the loans to people living in poverty. Those loans get repaid, and we repay investors. So we've now raised commitments of $50 million in capital with that. And we've also provided a financial distribution to our investors uh, for the first year of 3.6%. When you can mesh up these problems of cities and poverty with the global capital markets and provide an return to investors, then you have the scalability and the solvability of problems like that. So while we're still on water, I just want to, wanted to just get back to water. So London, and if you actually ask any doctor, what was the greatest thing that yeah. happened to medicine? It's that we figured out sanitation and Snow. immediately improved uh, health and well-being of public health uh, 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 in, in London. So the question really that attracts me to this whole sustainable development and thinking about people, not as just individuals who need water, who need health, who need this, is really think about the holistic approach to health and well-being. There's no point drinking water when your children can get access to a good education that will make them upwardly mobile. So it's not really a question of prioritizing. It's a question of how do we build resilient cities where people are thriving, where there's not a question of the rich and the poor, but everybody has equity. So I can talk about the fact that if you give people water and they have an emergency, right? This whole idea about universal access to healthcare, they have an emergency. Even people who are already on the way to becoming economically sustained to sustain their family, they end up right back into poverty. So I think we have a lot to learn right, about how you build cities that are resilient. Lagos has the worst uh, uh, traffic, even worse than Chicago. So, <laughs> so you can't say that. I don't believe it. <laughs> you, you go to the, on the third mainland bridge in Lagos, and you will see that. So when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about a way to actually think about the future of lots of people living in cities, I think we can do a lot together to address things that actually will get economic development. You address climate change, you get people health, you get them to school. Let's just imagine the cities of the future. And I think that there are lessons to learn, both in the global south and in the north, on how we can do things better. Uh, Leslie, you want to, yeah. Well, um, somebody just mentioned the word imagination, and it's one of my favorite words. It's something I tell to my students all the time, which is to live out of your imaginations, not just your history, and it's not my saying, it's Stephen Covey. But I'm reminded of a project that was once given to a friend of mine, a, an architect working for an NGO, NGO to um, build a community center for girls in northern Nigeria. And she found that the only time that girls were unsupervised was when they walked to and from the well to their house to collect water. So what started out as an architectural project eventually became a series of pamphlets telling you know, young girls about marriage, about menstruation, about women's rights. So the, 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 the solution, in a sense, wasn't a building at all. It was, it was a piece of paper. But it, it leads me to think about um, imagination as a tool. And I think this is a hugely important and critical part of what we do, as, I think, as educators, is to give voice, to give space to imagination. And we talk a lot about kind of the problematics of cities, you know, cities everywhere, not just the global south. But we, I think particularly because someone, you know, speaking from the educational sector, we don't spend nearly enough time 
thinking about how do we train people to think differently, to come up with different solutions. And that, that requires you know, imagination infrastructure. And I think we're phenomenally bad at doing that. Um, I want to move on to a slightly different topic. Uh, I know you've all read this wonderful supplement, <laughs> future, The Future of Cities, um, that, that we published uh, yesterday. So uh, on the front page there is my piece about, um, I compared uh, China to India, and, and really the people I talked to and the, and the, you know, the uh, uh, reporting that I did really led to the conclusion that uh, a lot of it comes down to the political systems of, of a country. Um, in China they can build uh, massive new cities overnight, they can build the fastest and largest high-speed train system in the world, um, but partly they can do that because it's an authoritarian system where they can just move pe a million people, two million people off the land uh, with, very little, uh, with very little pushback. So I wanted to ask the panel, um, you, you know, whereas in India, we always talk about in India, for example, the, the, uh, the infrastructure system is, is not as developed and why can't it be like China? But if you talk to politicians they, there, they'll say, well, we're a democracy. How can we move a million people? off of their land and just take it and build stuff. So I wanted to ask the panel a bit about the importance of political systems and how that shapes um, the cities that we're talking about. And Abba, maybe you can. Sure, uh, thanks, Jamil. I mean, I think it's, you know, political systems are basically how a country is governed or how a city is governed. So it, it really comes down to governance. And comparing um, China and India, I've always, I hope this is under Chatham House rules, <laughs> but I've always maintained that um, in India... I think it's being live streamed, Ava, so I don't, I don't think you could actually claim that you're not going to be attributed to this thing. <laughs> Views are personal. <laughs> that India has a system with voice and very little accountability downwards. So uh, you don't have accountability from city officials, from government officials, uh, and even politicians downward to the citizens. Um, in China, there is no voice, but there's a lot of accountability, but the accountability flows up, not down, um, as I was corrected earlier. <laughs> so that makes the difference, and also the fact that you know, every time we talk about a success, you know, so Singapore, you talk about Singapore, and people will tell you, oh, but that we can't compare our country to Singapore because it's a very unilateral decision-making, small country, island country, and so on and so forth. So political systems are really, really important. Um, and I wanted to say that I think the preceding uh, session was on metropolitan governance. And I think governance is, is key uh, because a political system eventually um, defines the governance um, of the country and percolates down to, um, to the city. And what we mean by governance is a leadership which has um, a strategic vision, which has long-term planning. And um, in a more um, a sort of focused way where you, know, you have principles of in integrity, both formal and informal, which means your officials are incorruptible to some extent. And I think that becomes important into service delivery, and uh, you know, and and it's a huge part of of inclusion. And I just wanted to take uh, 20 seconds to say that when you said, "What is your priority for a city?" Mm. Uh, for me, the priority is uh, you know the lack of uh, inclusion in cities, which then leads to slums and ghettos and uh, exclusion from services like water, sanitation, health. Um, and I think we need to focus on how do we bring inclusion into cities so there's no segregation, there are no um, slums on one side or south side of Chicago, and um, you know, basically um, it becomes a question of equity and inclusion. Lisa, you had uh, some interesting thoughts earlier when we were talking. <laughs> I'm probably going to get shot for saying this. I mean, I think um, most of Africa politically is still very feudal, certainly in the country that I live in, um, South Africa, and I'm not South African, I should say. I often say that it's a bit like being at the court of Henry VIII, um, and I think that was evidenced by, by um, the removal of Zuma. But one of the things that we very rarely talk about when we talk about cities in general is, is, is how does one make a culture of a city? I mean, Eagleton talks about culture being one or two of the three hardest words in the English language to define. And when we talk about things like policing, 
army municipality, we're also talking about the cultures that are embedded within those institutions, those structures. I think for large parts of, certainly of Africa, the culture that you inhabit, the culture that you come into when you come into the city is still largely ambiguous. People move from the rural areas, which is not just a geographical move, it's also a move in terms of, of time. We're, we're often coming from very feudal, very agrarian societies, bang, slap into the middle of the city. No one actually knows how to behave in the city. And we rarely talk about that. I mean, I think Nigeria is a very good example if you think about you know, so many people understand how to be in a city through watching Nollywood videos. That is not the purpose of a Nollywood video, is to how to instruct <laughs> you how to live in the city. But that's often the, the only image of the city that, that, you know, that one gets um, prior to arrival. So I think these are really complex um, questions, and a bit like you were saying earlier, you know, language is, is, is your thing. To be very specific about what you mean, I think, is, a, is, is of huge importance. Just, just to jump in. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, and then we'll go to. Okay. So, so I, I really enjoyed your article yesterday, because in part because it took me back to uh, some work I did 15 years ago, thinking about the trade-off between dictatorship and disorder where in some sense dictatorship occurs when you know, we have a highly empowered state that sometimes does wonderful things, you know, like Lee Kuan Yew often did in Singapore, and sometimes does things that are absolutely catastrophic, like, for example, the Cultural Revolution. Um, on the other hand, disorder is the everyday waste and, and chaos and loss that happens when a government is relatively non-functional. And, and in some sense, this China-India trade-off is thinking about the trade-off between disorder and, and dictatorship. But to me, at least the larger question, as we look at so many cities of the developing world, that are poorly governed in different ways. Will urbanization itself lead to better governed cities? I understand that it is tempting when we see all the chaos and all the troubles to think, boy, maybe we should just hold off on urbanization until the political system gets better. But how else is the political system going to get better without urbanization? Certainly that is how this happened in the West. I mean, if we think about you know, the, the story that um, our, our glorious leader told us yesterday about, about uh, urbanization in 16th century Netherlands and the Amsterdam building up the civic culture the voluntary associations that were so crucial in organizing the great revolt against the Netherlands Habsburg overlords, this could not have happened in the countryside. And indeed, this, this ability that cities often have to rise up and to force accountability right, on, their, on their leaders is sort of a crucial aspect of what we are asking the cities of Africa to do in the 21st century and asking all of us to, to participate in. And I'll just say one, you know, one way to think about this is, is scientifically, there are three aspects to what cities can do when they have you know, uh, vile overlords of a variety of different forms, one of which is revolt. And actually, there's good evidence showing that you know, what you know from your history books is true, that urbanization is related to r successful revolts against dictatorship. We saw this when Brutus overthrew the last Tarquin king 2,500 years ago in Rome, or in 1789 in Paris, or in Tahrir Square six years ago. The second question, and this is, of course, the big question about Tahrir Square, is can cities then, once they've overthrown a dictator, then make democracy stick? And this is a harder question, and I think the jury is still out on that. And the last question, which relates to your question really fundamentally, is do cities create a practice of civilization, a practice of working together with people that are different than you, a practice of organizing and associating in a way that can force governments to do what they need to do? And it's that last hope on which I think the future of the world is, is yeah, founded. Absolutely. Yeah. So community organizing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do in Chicago. That's what you do in Chicago, yeah. So, Gary, you could have... Just going back to your question about, you know, the, the political structures and systems and yours of imagination, right? Uh, that's so important. And we don't think of, like, government and political systems as where you go to find innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think we have to foster that from the bottom up. I think we need younger minds coming into the space, social entrepreneurs, who can rethink how these problems can be solved and not expect those solutions to come from the top down. You have organizations like the Skoll Foundation and the Schwab Foundation that invest heavily in social entrepreneurship to basically foster these types of activities. And I know from our perspective, you know, we would have never had a water credit approach. We would have still been out there drilling wells from a charity approach <laughs> if we hadn't had the support of the Skoll Foundation to reimagine the poor not as a problem but as a solution. And we can't underestimate the power of the bottom up from especially people, the millennials that are coming up, and how they're going to, to do this. And that still takes 
for all my talking about uh, commercial capital, that still takes philanthropic capital. Water.org still draws on philanthropic capital as social entrepreneurs must to be able to create the next version of some of these solutions from the bottom up. Yeah. Great. Do you, uh, I was going to go to questions. But yeah, can, I just yeah. wanted to, you know, this question about, um, you know, governance, how important it is in terms of how you prioritize the health of your population. So in healthcare, one um, global south city that I've really admired is how Chile was able to attain uh, near universal health coverage by really strengthening the public uh, 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 health system. Not that there would not be privatization of healthcare, but it was important to them that every Chilean had healthcare. And they built a robust system that didn't cost a lot, but then they achieved universal health care. And that's a model that we can learn from, from a global south city. We talk about Nigeria's response to Ebola crisis. And it, it so happens that because there had been philanthropy to try and eradicate polio in Nigeria, there was actually a system already in place in the most crowded and the largest city in Africa, that when Ebola came to Lagos, the public health system worked, and they were able to stem that epidemic, to the point that when it came to the US, we actually had to learn about what did Nigeria do, right? So this is why I think building resilient systems, building resilient uh, cities means that we cannot do I'm going to give you water, I'm going to give you education, I'm going to give you this. We've got to think about the ecosystem that gets us to really build infrastructure that sustains cities. And so I think there's a lot that we can all learn from each other. So Global South has a lot to contribute to the North, and the North has a lot to learn from the South as well. I like that. As, uh, so I'm going to move to questions and uh, give you a chance to uh, to, to ask this incredible panel some, uh, some of their thoughts. Now, uh, can we be clear that this is question time, not statement time? So <laughs> if you start making a long-winded statement, I'm just going to cut you off. That's, that's my main job here today. So uh, I think we'll start right there in the middle. Yeah, there are some mics coming. Uh, that woman there, and then you, sir, next. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much for all the discussion. I'm Kayuki. Uh, I'm a student delegate from the University of Tokyo. Uh, my question is, in order to uh, we, uh, prosper together, how can we uh, balance, have balance between uh, global south and north cities? And what kind of interactions are uh, needed? Balance between global south and global north. north. What are the interactions that are needed between south and north to uh, to allow both to, to prosper? Who wants to tackle that one? Well, I can start. I, I mean, one of the things that we've really been talking about in healthcare is really this whole idea of um, uh, making sure that there's equitable distribution of resources, and uh, and there's a whole consortium of universities in global health that's really talking about South-South partnership and figuring out some innovation that can actually be tested in a global South setting because they have, let's say, what do they have? They have to rebuild, right? And there's some things that we're doing here that we wish we, we didn't build them the way we did. So how can we actually do a partnership whereby we're creating innovative solutions to problems that can then scale both uh, in, 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 a, a, in the global south and, and, and global north. So I think this whole idea about imagination is really not that we are going to go and do something for the global south city, but that we can work collaboratively and learn from one another to be able to solve problems that affect vulnerable populations. The poor are everywhere. They're here and they're in the global south. So I think it's really finding partnerships and finding people who will bring us together, like the, you know, the resilient cities is, is, a, is an, a good idea, right? It's a good example of what Rockefeller Foundation is doing to try and bring best practices uh, in these uh, cities. If I may just, uh, yeah. so, Briefly, quickly, we want to give people, uh, yeah. if I may just say, there's a lot of 
south-south peer-to-peer learning among cities and south-north learning. And uh, since you're from Tokyo, let me give you the example of uh, resilience and building codes. Japan has developed amazing building codes because of the tsunamis and earthquakes and so on. And other cities are learning from that. Indonesia is learning a lot from, from Japan. So, um, you know, and I think that uh, when it comes to city problems, cities reach out to each other. There's a, a cloud of trust from one city to another, which is not there between two nation states. Um, so there is a lot of South-South and, and North-South peer-to-peer learning among cities, both ways. Uh, there's a gentleman here with a question. Uh, Gabriel Nagy, Urban Planning, uh, Mr. Glazer. I think that in your book, you talk about management. I think that there's a lack of management uh, at the leadership level to take risks to de really deliver change. I think that that's one of your, also of your observation. That's, that's why it's taking us so much to deliver change in the way in the South City. It's the lack of management, the lack of, uh, of risk-taking ability and, and maybe the, uh, the dreaming uh, portion of saying we can make a change. That, that's, that's certainly true. You, you highlight risk taking. I want, I want to actually circle back to management and water. So one of the points that was made about, about water is the difficulty of solving the last mile problem. And that's indeed what, what this is all about. The other problem is even if you've connected, making sure the water flows. So where I work on water in Lusaka and Zambia with Nava Ashraf and Bryce Steinberg, right, the water is going out constantly. It's, it's breaking all the time. Right? And to fix this, it's not going to work by just connecting with the, with the bottom-up group. You actually need to solve this from a managerial level. And I will just give a couple of things that we learn about this. First of all, when the pipes break, okay, you don't just have a rise of waterborne diseases. You have a rise of all form of contagious diseases, right? Because kids don't wash their hands when the water doesn't flow, right? You also see disruption in economic activity. And this is the most striking thing to me. You see changes in the time use patterns of young girls that they spend more time doing, child, doing chores and less time studying. So indeed, this point that when the water breaks, it actually, it actually imposes costs that are particularly borne by the most vulnerable young women in, in you know, sub-Saharan Africa is really crucial. Second point about this, though, institutions and incentives matter. The water company fixes the pipes of the customers who pay by the leader, who pay by the flow. They do not fix the pipes nearly as quickly for those customers who pay by the month, right? The financial incentives that they face, you know, they face the incentives to get the water flowing to those, those customers who are going to pay more when the water flows. Those are crucial to thinking about this. It's never just about engineering. It's about incentives, institutions, and management. I Time for, oh, <laughs> I'm sure you're going to agree with them, so I'm going to go to a, another question. Last question, there's a, there's a woman there. Uh, we've only got time for, for one more. Thank you. Oh. Hi, I'm Wendy Sternberg from Genesis at the Crossroads here in Chicago. I love, Leslie, your comment about imagination. A few people touched on that. And I, I think that um, my question is, when you look at creating ideas and putting them either in a pilot format or in something to scale, you have to deal with um, funders or governments interested in risk taking to do those things. And there's a lot of risk aversion. Mm. And it's a conversation more about being willing to fail to create better and better solutions. Mm. So I'd love to hear if you could do one at a time how you would get people to look at this whole notion of risk taking and failure for the greater good and take perhaps a longer term viewpoint so that if you fail five times but reach the brilliant solution on the sixth time, wasn't it worth it? Okay, I don't know if we've got time for everyone to give long answers, but maybe Leslie, do you want to tackle that one? Uh, it, it's a very, very good question. I, I always come back to, to it's a rather cheesy um, statement, which is that you've got to speculate to accumulate. And I think one of the things that the, the global north, the developed world, has been very good at um, owning is the fact that a risk pays off. I think for less developed portions of the world, there's always the risk that if you fail, the catastrophe is going to be worse than the existing condition. And, and that's where I think that the imagination is absolutely key. I, I particularly put this at, at the level of management and leadership. If we see our leaders taking risks, if we see management taking risks, that sort of approach does, does, does filter down. Yeah. 
and I think it's, take, it's where does the risk taking happen and what's the level of risk people are willing to take? The private sector in the social impact space, there's a, a great appetite for taking risk. But as you move up the chain, as you move into governments, they want to take more measured risk. They want more evidence. And I think that's what we've done, particularly with the government of India, is we've come in and demonstrated that there are millions of people who will uh, pay for these services if they can get access to capital. And so the government of India is like, prove it to us. You know, the microfinance institutions are like, prove it to us. So we use our philanthropic capital to help de-risk this for them so that this scales up. And now the government of India is using the water credit approach as a model to roll out across the states because they no longer have to provide all the funding from the top down. The great miracle of cities is that they generate new ideas by combining old ideas. The thing that cities really do that matters is it enables us to play to our greatest human asset, our ability to steal ideas from the people around us, our ability to learn from, from a crowd, right? When that gets turned off because of government regulation or because of government ineptitude or because of government risk aversion, we lose that, that ability for cities to generate the ideas that will transform the world. But I think it's really important that we remember that for 2,500 years, Right, since Socrates and, and Plato bickered on an Athenian street corner through Renaissance Florence to the Dutch Golden Age, right to 19th century Chicago, cities have been working miracles. And when you look at the global south, the age of miracles is not done. Right? It is still around us every day in Lagos or in Johannesburg, and, and it is so important to engage with that and to work to make those cities more healthy and more magical. Yeah. I, I just, so. oh, yep. I just want to say the, this whole idea about of economic inclusion I think is what's going to transform cities. And if we all think about that, that's really going to be really the engine that drives economic development and everybody can be all in it together. The south side of Chicago, when you hear about it from outside Chicago, you think that nothing is happening, but all the experiments, all the community organizing that's happened, the inclusiveness that's going on economically now is making the place a vibrant place for everyone to come visit. So come to the south side of Chicago. So I thought that was a, <laughs> I thought that was a great place to end, but this is an even better place to end. So thank you to my wonderful, wonderful panel, and thank you all for, for listening, and uh, see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.